Well, welcome back, dear friends, to another episode of the Artisans of the Horizon, this series that I started at the beginning of the pandemic and it has thankfully uh, continued going, where we showcase different thought leaders, um, artists, musicians, people who are on the edge, people who are really doing the work of helping us to paint not just what the horizon is, but also what is right beyond the horizon. And um, this whole metaphor I has found over the years to be very robust and I come back to it on a, uh, on a daily basis. And one of the horizons we're gonna talk about today is this whole phenomenon um, of confronting religious institutions that seem to be very adamant about um, designing borders and boundaries that keep people out of sacred spaces. Um, and we're going to have a conversation with two courageous people who are trying to do that work and be like, hey, let's not actually do that because that's not actually what spirit wants to do in the world and in the body of Christ. And, um, and we're going to see how that's going for them. Um, so I would like to first throw it to Alexa to share a bit about us, about us, your name, your pronouns, where you're from, and then you can toss it to Tom. Yeah, sure. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, my name's Alexa Ord. I use she, they pronouns. Um, and I currently uh, live in Brooklyn, but am originally from Idaho. And um, part of what I do is I work um, with my dad, Tom Ward at Sacre Sage Press. Um, and we're here to talk about our book. So um, Tom, if you want to add a little more about our project. Yeah, well, I'm Tom. Uh, I direct a doctoral program in open and relational theology, and I've been a theologian writing a bunch of books. But this particular project is a book of about 90 essays written by current or former members of the Church of the Nazarene uh, advocating for full LGBTQ inclusion in the denomination. Currently, the denomination has a stance on human sexuality, that uh, says that unless you're in you know, uh, mar uh, heterosexual marriage relationships, any kind of sexual activity is uh, sinful. Uh, the orientation, as they would put it in the, in the uh, article, is not inherently sinful, but any activity, any expression of that orientation would be sinful. And what we and a bunch of queer people, allies, scholars, leaders, are asking for is a change in perspective on those issues. And so for those who are watching, the book looks like this, it's gorgeous. I got the hardcover, which I love because it looks like a textbook and that's what I love about it because I'm nerdy. <laughs> Alexa uh, gets the credit for that cover. It's yes, beautiful. I, I did design it, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful and it's eye-catching and I just, I love it. I, one of the, I love Sacre Sage mainly because I think y'all's um, covers are just so beautiful. Um, I was like, clearly there's a queer person somewhere in the midst designing. <laughs> 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 and that, you know, is a, I mean, I'm joking about it, but in, in a lot of ways, I'm very serious about it. And I think that's one of the elements uh, to these kind of conversations that's so crucial. Um, I think in a lot of ways, our conversations around gender and sexuality are very reductionistic. Um, they uh, limit people to either their genitalia or who they go to bed with or how they show up um, in regards to self-expression. And I've always, in my work as a queer person, as a queer theologian, um, as a queer priest, uh, trying to invite people to realize that we as the beloved children of God are very robust beings. You know, we have dreams, we have anxieties, we have stressors, we have hopes. Um, a lot of those are very similar to what straight people have and cisgender people have, but there are also those that are very different. And if we could operate from a space of trust that we might not understand, but we can trust the spirit is still moving in your life, that maybe that might be an open door to having a more richer understanding of being a person of faith, being a disciple, but also being a denomination, um, mm -hmm. which is how I see this book playing, playing well in the, in the body of Christ and that it does that. You know, the scripture says, we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a lot of power in the spoken word and the spoken testimony, which is, mm -hmm. These are, are spoken testimonies with the lives of people who are in this book, but they're also written as well. 
Um, so tell me a little bit about just that, like how has your personal testimony uh, provoked um, people in your denomination and your own personal lives, uh, maybe provoked them to a new understanding, maybe it's provoked them to say, I don't wanna be in relationship with you. Um, how has that played out in your life? And maybe is there has there been a testimony or an experience from somebody that changed you, that, that made you change your mind? Anyone you can go. I think Tom definitely has got uh, the best. Nobody can top his uh, provoking the denomination experience. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you know, I'm, I'm the kind of person who, um, because uh, I, I've benefited from having people love me and my family, both my immediate family and my extended family. And I've had the benefit of having a good education um, and that has equipped me to be the kind of person who is probably more a bigger risk taker than most would be when it comes to trying to challenge things I think fly in the face of love. And for me, love is at the very core of who I want to be. It's the reason why I try to follow Jesus and consider myself a Christian. And um, because of that, I sometimes do and say things that go against the grain of uh, the, the denomination I'm affiliated with. But my thinking on uh, LGBTQ plus issues began to change in the early 1990s. I was a student, a graduate student at Nazarene Theological Seminary, and I thought I really need to get to the bottom of what in those days we called the homosexuality issue. And uh, so I collected a bunch of books and read scholars and changed my mind to be what we today call fully affirming. Um, for me, it was not, unlike most people who change their mind over this because like a friend, a, a family member, someone they know comes out. For me, the only person I really knew who was queer was my uh, brother-in-law, who's not a very nice guy. I mean, <laughs> he's not a model citizen. <laughs> and uh, and so it wasn't an experience with someone who was queer that sort of made me decide I should change. It was really a, a um, an intellectual adventure that led me to change my mind. So maybe I'll start there. What about you, yeah, I would say, um, you know, I really benefited from my um, from my parents, uh, you know, working through the quote unquote homosexuality issue uh, when I was uh, before I was born and or a young child in that, you know, as a queer person growing up, I never felt like that was I, I never felt like my parents would never accept me or even that it was not an option, you know, ever like growing up, um, my parents always, you know, held space for the possibility that uh, I would be queer. You know, they never talked about, oh, when you get married to a man, dot, dot, dot. Um, but, you know, I definitely didn't have that same experience in the church. Um, and and there was always a lot of tension between, um, yeah, my experience at home and knowing that, that we were kind of always pushing against the grain of the denomination. Um, and how that's sort of translated now into uh, both my story and the stories of the people in the book um, is uh, kind of what you were saying, Jerry, about um, that not all queer people look alike. <laughs> <laughs> that, um, I think a lot of folks, a lot of, um, of uh, folks who are not currently affirming in the Church of the Nazarene and elsewhere really have an idea that that LGBTQ uh, rights and justice and community is only a, um, a white gay male couple who is married, has a picket fence, has adopted some kids and looks just like you and me, you know? They're exactly the same as straight people except they're having sex with men. <laughs> um, and that's just not true. That's not realistic to, you know, the incredible uh, diversity and, and beauty of, of queerness. Um, and that's really exemplified in this book. And I think there are lots of, of little inlets in this book to experiencing the fullness of queerness and of, uh, of God's creation. Um, yeah. So I think we wanted to show that there's, you know, a million ways to be queer. Oh yeah. It's, it's, it's wild. Sometimes I'm like, 
I get together with some of my friends and I'm like, whoa. Like, <laughs> like, let's bring it down a minute. <laughs> like, this is wild. Um, but I love it. It's so much fun. And um yeah, and it's just that's one of the things that I think for queer people in trying to live a life of resistance in a culture and in a, in a system, a political system, where um, there is a genocide against queer people happening right now, um, as well as people of color. Um, I think one of our remedies to that, which has always been something that we've always done and always has been a default for us, is the cultivation of, of play and joy and extravagance. Um, I mean, just look at the ball scene, the ballroom scene, um, which was re-brought back to the mainstream through the Pose uh, Netflix series um, or TV show. Um, and it, it gave us an insight into what queer people have always known is that, well, the world looks terrible, but we're gonna redecorate it because that's what we do, you know? And it's gonna be fun. And there's something inherently divine in that. Mm -hmm. um and that's what i try to get people back to is that there is something inherently divine in that it, there because there's no way that the human mind in and of itself could come up with this idea like oh all of this horrible stuff is happening in society so like why do we have a party like your human mm -hmm. mind would not necessarily think that way so the god mind has to be the one that comes up with that um, so I, I like that, Jerry, and it makes me I got to cut in here as a theologian, because yeah. I'm, the way you're talking, I'm like going, yes, preach it, Jerry, preach it. <laughs> and and, and I want to say so much depends on your God concept, right? I, yeah. like, if your God concept is one with strict boundaries, black and white, this and that, very clear, no fluidity. Uh, then you're probably going to be on the anti-LGBTQ side of things because that's going to be way too much gray for you. Yeah. But if you're like you, Jerry, and you have a God concept uh, that is fluid, that is uh, beyond boundaries and structures and categories, then you're probably going to be a lot more open to the book that Alexa and I have uh, edited. Yeah. And so tell me about the process of this book, like how, Whose idea was it? How did it come about? How did you select the folks who are in? I mean, I thought at first it was 60, but apparently there's 90. So that's, I haven't read all of it. I'm only like halfway through. Um, and uh, so, yeah, tell me, give me all the dish on it. Well, I'll start and then let Alexa do the, the nuts and bolts. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, probably the best way to start by talking about this book is to say that a year and a half ago, I underwent an official trial by the denomination because I am an affirming person. And I had to uh, go meet with a committee who heard the case. And I presented a case that instead of trying to defend myself as somehow in within the bounds of orthodoxy and the denomination when it comes to human sexuality issues, that I was not, but the denomination needed a change, not me. And uh, strangely, the committee didn't kick me out. Uh, they still, the district superintendent figured out a way to unassign me and silence me, but I'm still an, officially an ordained elder in the Church of the Nazarene. However, uh, last November or so, I think it was, uh, when I got word from the local leader that I could no longer preach in the church where I uh, attend and serve, um, I thought to myself, I think maybe it's time for me to take another step forward and try to um, try to do something to make changes in the denomination beyond what I'd already done. And that's when I approached Alexa about this book. Mm. Alexa, you want to take it? Sure. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Tom and I have been working together for um, a year and a half or so at Sacrosage, um, sort of looking to help um, publish books that are don't really have a home um, in sort of safe traditional publishing. And how can we how can we make room for more sort of um, pushing the boundaries of ideas of theology? Um, so we were already sort of in the book publishing space together and thought, you know, one thing that we hear a lot is uh you know from the the various um 
leaders of the denomination that they they get a lot of phone calls and emails and you know people giving them feedback being so angry about queer issues in the church but they're not hearing from the people who are lgbtq affirming and uh there's there's a real disparity in what sort of gets brought to their attention and we thought mm -hmm. well we know lots of people who uh you know believe the same way that we do have had these experiences in the church maybe we really need to make a collection of you know an, an amassing of testimony of here's the queer experience in the church here are all of these allies and scholars thinking and and creating around this issue um and how can yeah how can this serve as a witness to the reality something that can't be can't be ignored um so yeah so tom um has a lot of of contacts with the denomination and so we reached out to um folks that we thought uh would be comfortable and excited about contributing and of course you know we wanted we called this book a somewhat uh unwieldy title why the church of the nazarene <laughs> yeah <laughs> you have i'm to blame for the title jerry it is a it's a gaudy uh awkward title but i still like it even though it's it's tough to get it out but anyway sorry alexa I no 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 that's we yeah we <laughs> tom was committed to the title from the beginning because um for especially a lot of the allies and scholars who contributed we really wanted to push folks to take a stand publicly that a lot of people you know had held this affirming position privately for years but if they you know spoke out publicly they'd be risking their jobs um and we thought this is really the time to to sort of follow the momentum of tom's um trial and to to make more of a public statement you know I'm seeing even today, Alexa, we haven't talked about this, but even today, that phrase, it just bugs the heck out of me. Uh, love the sinner, hate the sin. Uh, a lot of people in the Church of Nazarene would not want to go as far as this book goes. They would want to say, oh, we should love queer people, by which they mean we shouldn't treat them badly by, you know, stoning them or something. And that's maybe extreme, but uh, but we should accept them into the church. But what they're doing and who they are is inherently sinful. And we wanted to get beyond that argument to say, let's say, no, we're going to be fully affirming. There is healthy, righteous sexual activity that's not heter heteronormative. Um, and so that's why that awkward title is the way it is. <laughs> well, I often tell people in my coaching and consulting, I said, don't use um, coded language when you're promoting something. Be very plain English. And so I, I like that title in the sense that it, it tells you exactly what the book is about, um, which yeah. is great. And so it's easy to grab off the shelf. You know immediately what this is going to be about. And there's not a, too much mystery. So that I think that's a good practice. So I support that. <laughs> um, and then also to your point about the stoning, that actually does happen, and it's in law books in other countries, uh, even to this yeah. day. So that's a very real reality. Um, so it's extreme in this country, but it's normative in other countries. Um, yeah. And some of those countries condone it under religious language as well. Um, but I think to your point also, too, about the love the sin or hate the sin, um, which I'm still surprised that that still goes around because that's so old. Um, but it's bad theology. Like, how can, like, if scripture says that um, God is love and those who live in love live in God and God lives in them. So if that's the case and God is in you because you are a loving being, how can you also hate at the same time? Yeah. Because it doesn't make, it's like asking for water and poison at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, so it doesn't make any sense. Uh, theologically as well as just it's just bad <laughs> it's just bad uh it's just not good um it, but that's a that's a good point i think in regards to um what you raised the lexa about like what people hear about and what comes before them um is it this everybody is angry because we're talking about this and like this should not be a thing or is it the stories of lived experiences of people who have very, very real experiences of the divine on a regular basis? Um, that if we listen to them, those stories, we actually could discover new pieces to this mystery that we call the divine. Mm. Um, you know, I often talk about that in my teachings. I say that, you know, God is like a puzzle. 
and we are the pieces. And so we need to have each one of us because without one of us, the, the puzzle will never be complete. Mm -hmm. It'll always be a mystery. It'll always be kind of blurry. Um, yeah. So that means I have to be humble enough to say, hmm, I don't understand. But I do understand that I'm not in control in this world um, and that, or not in control alone um, in this world and that I have to be willing to commit to this life and say, well, what's unfolding before me? Mm, um, yeah. And let's see where God is in the midst of all of that. And part of that unfolding, like, you know, I'm, I'm coming to you as, as someone in his mid fifties, uh, the whole uh, human sexuality set of questions have unfolded in my lifetime in really interesting ways. I mean, I, Jerry, you may remember this, uh, you're not as old as I am, but uh, Will and Grace was like a big hit oh, TV yeah. show in which they showed characters who were gay. Uh, that was like groundbreaking stuff when it mm -hmm. came out. And now, like, you know, practically every sitcom's got a gay character or two. It's like just normal, you know. Uh, the language, you know, I earlier mentioned that the word homosexuality is what we used all the time in the 90s. Now, if someone uses that today, we think, you know, we're, aren't you up to date? You know. <laughs> <laughs> And in, yeah. in, in, uh, in that spirit, I want to try something out on both of you that you both might reject outright and say, nope, Tom, you're out in left field. Um, I want to suggest, <laughs> I'll put it bluntly in a weird way. I want to suggest that I'm queer too. And mm -hmm. this is what I want, how I want to suggest it. Um, even though I'm a straight white guy, um, I think that the typical categories of sexuality and gender are philosophically untenable. And because they're philosophically untenable, we can't use those to make sense of gender and sexuality. And that queerness is actually the way of things. So that mentality in and of itself, even though you know I have sex with my wife and nobody else, uh, that mentality is a queer mentality. Um, what do you think of that? I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, you have a degree. <laughs> I think that, um, yeah, I don't know that I have ever said this to you, Dad, but it's kind of my my go-to line <laughs> when introducing uh, myself in other settings that I identify as queer both in my sexuality, in my gender identity, and in my politics, that part of queer as an identity is a political stance and a political uh, yeah. positioning. And I think that's that's what you're saying too, is that taking a queer approach to uh, to all of your ideals and the way that you're living your life, yeah, is that's inherently what queerness is. So yeah. I'll, I'll take it, I'll claim you. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Absolutely, yeah. And I, I so appreciate your point about um, uh, the politics because queerness has always been political from the very get go. Um, because ultimately queerness is about power and it's about questioning power, provoking power, harnessing power in what some people might think are strange places or with strange people. Um, and it's ultimately about um, disruption. Queer theory defines queerness as the disruption of dualism. And, um, and I think that's one of the reasons, Tom, why I love your theology and why I have like 12 of your books <laughs> it, <laughs> is the fact that it does that. It questions, it confronts, it provokes, um, it disrupts the dualism that we fall into in our theologies. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I think it's inherently queer. And I think anytime people do that, like question what is and say, there's probably more here. Than, than we're allowing ourselves. I think that's a very queer thing to do. Um, mm. And uh, yeah, so I, I think you're right. You're in the right space. You're in the right room. Uh, <laughs> Good. <laughs> we love you. We welcome you. I love it. Well, I uh, need to give credit to one of the contributors to our book who started me thinking like this a couple of years ago. Her name is Keegan Osinski. She wrote a book called Queering Wesley, and Wesley being John Wesley, the theologian. And she goes back and looks at some of his sermons, and she has a queer account of them. 
And I thought to myself, okay, what's queer about this has, in most of those cases, little to do with sexuality and gender. It has to do with rethinking the categories and putting his thought outside the norm, outside yeah. of what one might expect, a political, a philosophical kind of a move. So thanks to you, Keegan. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, outside the norm, outside the lines. Um, you know, I think, I'm, I haven't published it yet, but I'm, I've written a little bit of it. I need to finish it. But I wrote an apologia to... Um, to heteronormative Christianity. Um, and uh, I, it's like an old, you know, in the old early church days, the church fathers and mothers would write these apologias to try to explain these ideas to other folks or to, in a very nice and roundabout way, being like, you're wrong and here's why. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I thought, oh, I want to do that. I'm going to do it to heteronormative Christianity and, and America and be like, here's why you should include and affirm and prioritize the lived experience of queer people, not just because it's a political thing to do or whatever, or it's a contemporary issue, uh, but because these are all the wonderful things that we bring to the body of Christ and to society as a whole. For instance, we are very robust when it comes to love. Mm. And what I mean by that is we have been forced for so long to find intimacy mm. and relationships and love and, and hope um, and, and sensuality in weird places. Mm. Sometimes that's in the back room of a really smoky bar um, where all you can really tell is like, you see these little shadows of bodies running around. Um, sometimes it's in a dark alley in a doorway. Um, sometimes, it's uh, it's found in in churches, or you know, in academies and boarding schools. Um, it's found in in strange places. But those moments when we find those, and they're oftentimes moments because we're not oftentimes allowed uh, to have long term relationships um, until recently. Until we started, um, that was one of the beautiful things about uh, gay marriage getting passed is that it gave license politically and systemically to have longer term relationships. Mm. Um, uh, but because oftentimes they were moments, we learned very quickly the sacredness of intimacy and that mm. intimacy can be found in weird places and strange places. Mm. I often go to scripture too to validate this. You know, Mary Magdalene was the one who saw Jesus uh, when he was resurrected. But I often say the only reason why the resurrection happened and she was the one that saw it was because she had an intimate relationship with Jesus. Mm. And what I mean by that, and I'm not saying that she was his lover or anything like that, even though I kind of wish that was the case. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I hope the dude had sex at some point while he was on earth. Because <laughs> it's a, like, the thought about having Christ as your lover, that would be phenomenal. Um, <laughs> I was like, that'd be some good sex. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, but what I'm saying is that intimacy would only have been the reason why she would have gone on her own to the to the to the gravesite where the tomb was mm. and to just sit there and to linger in her grief in her loss and to have enough faith that when the person came to her, when Jesus came to her and said, why are you crying? She would, she thought it was the gardener and said, wherever you've taken him, please tell me where he is. Cause I want him. I want mm -hmm. him back. And then he says, Mary in the original language, a Greek language, it's actually a nickname. The way he says her name is, that we know as to be a nickname. So it denotes a certain level of personal connection. Um, mm. it's like if it wasn't for that intimacy, pulling her into that very strange place where you never thought you would find love, the resurrection would never have happened. Yeah. Or we never would have known about it. And I think yeah. that's a, one of the gifts that queer people can bring. But you won't know that if you don't let us into all your spaces. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so anyway, I can watch the main on that forever. But yeah. I like the way you bring in the scripture, though, because for a good number of people who are attacking us and attacking this book, 
they start their attack by saying, the Bible clearly says, and then they'll cite Leviticus or Romans chapter one or whatever. They'll mm -hmm. pick out one of those seven or eight clobber verses in scripture and, and put it out there. Um, and, you know, there's ways, there's good ways, I think, to explain those clobber verses in ways that aren't clobbering to queer people. But I always want to say, let's step back and ask the bigger question. What's the overall themes of scripture? And for me, those point to love. And that's the entryway, I think, into a healthy conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. I'm so glad. I'm so glad we're having this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it's very life-giving. Um, so what have been some of the... Um, so this question is for you. What have been some of the highlights for you as a queer person um, doing this work in the world and showing up in the world? What were some of the highlights for you in, in putting this book together? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that this has been in some ways uh both healing and you know sometimes when you when to make a wound heal you gotta cut it open and dig out all the decay <laughs> so, not that it's a it's all a, an easy easy time but um I am no longer religious or spiritual at all and I I have left the church long ago but not for this the, the issues with the this reason um but it always I've always felt kind of like I, I haven't been able to show up really uh, as myself in in the spaces that I grew up in um, because there's always a part of my life I couldn't talk about. Um, and in some ways, you know, this is even just announcing this book is going to be the first time a lot of my friends from church will even know that I was affirming, let alone queer. <laughs> and that that's kind of a... a a uh, hard but good ground to travel. Um, and it it also feels feels good um in putting together this book. A lot of the the contributors talk about um in fact one of our one of our essays is called Because I Want My Children to Live. A lot of them talk about their experiences as parents of queer children or just general concern for queer youth, um, for wanting a better future. And it feels really good to be kind of an example of that, of, you know, I obviously had a really affirming childhood and don't uh, carry a huge amount of trauma. You know, I have a, a relatively positive a story of growing up queer. Um, and so now to, to try and present that back to the church that I grew up in feels like uh, a new a new potential, you know, the, a new horizon for um, for other queer people that not just we want to make a better future, but that that future is now. Yeah. Hmm. I love that. I love that. I have a very I have, I have a similar experience in the sense of like um, um, I had a moment with church. I had a reckoning with church, uh, with the denomination I was raised in where I suddenly um, suddenly had the realization that something did not make sense. I was 16 years old. I remember very clearly to this day, I was sitting in the sanctuary of the church I was attending at the time. We had just finished youth group. I was studying for confirmation. Um, and I was sitting in the sanctuary and it was a gorgeous day and the sun was shining through the stained glass and this sanctuary had a lot of really beautiful hand-painted um, icons and it was a gorgeous sanctuary. Um, and I remember sitting in there and thinking to myself, how could God who created human beings to have such wonderful intelligence that they can create all this wonderful beauty that's in front of me and design it so perfectly in such a way that when the light hits it, it shines through and it makes this radiance and this aura um, and to make this space so peaceful, um, how can that God also too make beings who, according to the denomination I was raised in, um, which still has it on its official books that queer people um, are inherently disordered. Um, mm. How can that God also too create beings who are inherently disordered? Um, it doesn't make sense to me. And so my next thought was, I had just read at the time Henry Nowen's book, uh, The Life of the Beloved. Um, and 
I remember thinking that's where he talks about how um, all of us are God's beloved children um, and that God, what I would say today, God is radically obsessed with us. And so God wants to be involved in our life and loves us from the top of our head to the soles of our feet. Um, and so I was coming to the awareness of that reality after reading that book. And I remember thinking, okay, well, if Henry is right, and Henry was a, a Roman Catholic priest, um, and he was also a gay man, even though he never really fully came to term with it uh, in his lifetime. Um, he, uh, if this is what he's saying, and this is what he's advocating, and I believe him, and it just makes sense to me, then this dis dissonance I'm experiencing means that somewhere along the way, I was lied to. Um, and God's representatives on earth are really not very good people. <laughs> uh, and they got God wrong, like from the get go. And I thought, so that was a turning point. So where some queer people would say, okay, well, I'm done with church altogether. I'm just gonna go do my my thing over here. And, uh, and so be it. I was like, mm, no, I'm done with the liars, but there's something more here that, mm -hmm that needs to be shared and that's the belovedness. And I want to live my life committed to living into what that means for me, but also to let other people know um, this truth. Because I think um, if the ultimate message of Christianity is the resurrection, that we can rise again after, after turmoil and trauma, then I think all of Good Friday is done. Um, and it's our job to be resurrected people, to be people of liberation who are also liberating while also being liberated. Um, and so that means that we need to go into the world and be that in the world. Um, I often tell people, I'm not trying to save the world. Like when I talk about activism, like I'm not trying to save the world. The world has already been saved by Jesus. And also the world was created by God and it's inherently good. Um, I'm just trying to help people realize it <laughs> uh, and, and to tune into that and to part and participate in that. Um, so that was my kind of journey and that experience. And that's what I've been doing for the rest of my life, really, is, um, is trying to help people realize you are beloved. God doesn't actually hate you. It's the people who are representing God who have made you think that, but they're actually lying. And um now spend your life getting to know that God was radically obsessed with you. Um, in the I book that, uh, oh, sorry. that's all right, I'll, I'll toss you in a second. In the book that y'all published, Partnering with God, in my essay that I put into that book, I talk about that. That's the name of the book, that God wants all of me. Um, from the, again, the whole idea of God is radically obsessed with you. I don't think God gives us an F for failure. I think God gives us a G for grace. Mm. Anyway, go ahead, Tom. Well, I was just going to say your own story, I think helps, <clears throat> helps people to realize that what counts as spirituality has been broadened in our day. Yeah. You know, um, I think in the past people who were spiritual had to have say certain things had to have a certain, uh, you know, I don't know, a prayer life, or they had to uh, be deep in the meditation or something, which I got no problem with either one of those. But um, I think spirituality today is much more broad, and it can include some of the traditional expressions, but um, many expressions that most people wouldn't call spiritual, I would call spiritual. Yeah. Well, and it's also too reminds me of Dostoevsky, he said in one of his books that um, beauty will save the world, mm -hmm. you know, and that movement, beauty saved my life because it's the one that uh, provoked me to wonder um, that question of how can this all be, but then also this, you know, yeah. and um, so I, I think it's well, beautiful. It was, yeah. As soon as someone asked the question, is there more, is there more to my life, is there more to mathematics and science is there more whatever then i think they're moving into the spiritual realm what philosophers call the realm of transcendence and i think most people on the planet maybe some people never ask the more question but most people on the planet they have some inkling 
that there's more. Uh, and so in my way of thinking, they're spiritual. Yeah. yeah. Well, along those lines too, um, in this, I'm, I'm sure, so I wanted to go back actually, because there was a point I wanted to make earlier about language. And then I wanted to use it to tie into my next question. Um, so I don't consider you, Tom, an ally. I consider you to be an accomplice. Okay, what's the difference? And the difference is this. An ally is a person who says, this is your battle and I wanna support you in it. And they, they're always a step behind. An accomplice is somebody who says, this is our battle together, mm. that we're gonna to fight together. And also they migrate sometimes a little bit before the other person who might be the main character, so to speak, in, the, in this like battle or this play. But they also use their power as not being the quote unquote main character to step up a little bit further to kind mm. of help clear the way and set up some of the, to take some of the risks, I think, that the main character quote unquote can take. Um, so um, I like that. I was thinking about, I was thinking different than accomplice and ally. Someone online posted something to the effect of do allies get stoned alongside queer people? And mm -hmm. I thought, I'm the kind of person who's going to get stoned alongside, not stoned in the marijuana sense, but <laughs> stoned in the sense of getting rocks thrown. <laughs> uh, I want to be yeah. a, a part of that. Yeah. And that's what I would think would, that's what I consider an accomplice. And so I, yeah. and I bring that point up because I think it's important about power. Again, I said that queerness is about power. Um, and sometimes in these conversations, um, we expect queer people to explain everything to non-queer people or to do the heavy lifting. And I'm saying, no, I, to have a robust, vibrant church and movement uh, in society, we have to do this together. Um, take our leadership and take our critiques because it is ultimately our story. Um, but there are certain avenues that we will never be able to go down or certain doors that we will never be able to open but you can because you have those keys or you have that roadmap. Um, and so doing that in, in, in communion with uh, is a part of, it's what I mean uh, as being an accomplice, which I think is yeah. more important than an ally. Um, I, li I like that because politically, I, I fear there's something going on amongst straight people. I'll, I'll use the word heterosexual people. I, I I fear there's something going on. I think some heterosexual people believe that since they are attracted to the opposite sex and are fairly normative in their behaviors, they can't be on team queer. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they can't, they can't consider themselves queer. Or maybe they're an ally in the sense that you sort of said, kind of standing back saying, go get them, you know, but I'm over here. Yeah. Um, I, I want to change the narrative. So there's something like a heterosexual queer person by which I mean, they have opposite set of attraction. They may be like me and been married for 30 plus years. Uh, and, you know, I'll never had an affair, you know, always had the same, the same wife. Uh, but they see that the categories of gender and sexuality are screwed up for most people. And they need to have this expansive queer understanding of reality. And it's okay to have an opposite sex attraction and still think the boundary should disappear. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And it's a good conversations to have and important as well. Um, I think and as, a, as a way to kind of uh, wrap ourselves up a little bit um, and this wonderful uh, uh, rainbow wrapping paper um, <laughs> <laughs> is, um, I want to uh, I want to ask the question um, where you share your own personal thoughts, but, and then I will uh, wrap this up. And that question is: um, since the publication of this book, um, what has been some of the um, the negative, you know, backlash that you've experienced, either individually or collectively? Um, I mean, I know that you are probably undergoing another trial, or they're going to try to do that. Um, you know, has. Um, the thing I think that's oftentimes that happens in stuff like this is, which I think is probably the most hurtful, is it's those people who don't disagree with you and who probably do agree with you, um, 
and who want to support, but for whatever reason, they can't publicly support you because they have a church, they have a pension, you know, they have, um, they can't speak out because they have a family that they have to support. Um, but they're they're on your side. They just can't be on your side publicly. And it's even worse when they have to go and actually publicly make statements against you when you know they're not actually against you. Um, I think that's kind of the struggle. So where do you feel like, um, I'll frame it this way. Um, who's your, um, who's in charge over clergy and your denomination? You don't have bishops. Um, our system is set up so that we're divided into regions across the United States and across the world. They're called districts. Mm -hmm. And there's a district superintendent who has, who manages that, that region. And then there are six general superintendents, which are kind of like bishops. Okay. So six worldwide bishops and then a bunch of district superintendents. Okay. So, and if you had a problem or a concern, like a pastoral concern where you needed some pastoral support, you would go to one of the general intentions. Not really. No. <laughs> okay. I well, mean, then who would you go to? If I had a pastoral concern? Yeah. For yourself, like say uh, your wife, suddenly discovered she has cancer you don't know how to deal with it um yeah you know something like that a clergy like me would probably find another clergy in in the vicinity to go to for help okay they, they normally wouldn't go to their superintendents okay um so i asked that because uh, my my thing would be how would your um if you were to go to that person and you wanted pastoral support in this because of all the backlash and the and everything that's happened, um, what would that look like for you? Like, how would you describe that? Like, would you just want somebody to say, "This really sucks. I'm sorry you're going through it. You know, I'm here for you." Or do you want them to make a statement? And the reason why I ask is because. Um, I think oftentimes this is the part where people can maybe offer support that's maybe not necessarily very public. Um, and it might be, you know, it might be worth putting out there. Yeah. Or maybe it doesn't I mean, apply to you. <laughs> yeah, I, I probably am a rare, a weird case um, insofar as I'm a fairly public figure. And probably most of the other clergy in my area look at me as kind of an anomaly mm. because I'm a, I'm a theologian, uh, even though I am clergy still, um, they, yeah, they probably don't think of me like that. But to your point about support, there are lots of people who are sending me private notes, will never say anything in public because they can lose their job. I don't know if you're getting those too, Lex, but, um, I'm I'm getting lots of private notes from people saying, you know, we're behind you, support you, but I just can't come out on this. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the most beautiful things that has occurred is that we have a private Facebook group for people who wrote in the book and supporters, and that continues to grow. And that's a really encouraging place. It's like I didn't when. Yeah, I didn't imagine that would emerge. And that's been really helpful. There's other groups that I monitor from time to time in which I'm literally called the devil. I'm literally called, you know, the one who's tearing up the body of Christ. And, you know, they are, you know, very well. One, as one person said, you guys are just downright mean here. <laughs> uh, um, and that's no fun. You know, I like to think I have, uh, you know, some sort of a shield I can put up and none of those darts would hurt me, but that's not true. They hurt me still. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm very glad to know Satan. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love it. I'm so grateful. I always wanted to have Lucifer in my circle. Um, you know, so I got my wish. Um, blessed be. Um <laughs> What about you, Alexa? How's how's it been dealing with this for you? You might you're probably not you're not in the church world, so you probably have a bit more covering. Definitely, yeah. I'm I'm definitely a lot more insulated from it, but that also comes with I'm a lot more isolated 
from the sort of movement. Um, and actually it reminds me a lot, especially because a large amount of my engagement um, with the sort of response has been through that Facebook group. Mm. Um, it feels really reminiscent to um, when Tom was uh, publicly fired from the Nazarene institution in 2015. 15. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, in which, you know, our whole town and our whole community was really divided about my family. And because I was in college on the other side of the country, I also engaged in that space largely through Facebook. Um, and so it's it's interesting to me to sort of, you know, renegotiate those feelings and um, and both sort of the, you know, the traumatic memories of a, another experience where the church has really harmed my family, but also um in both those instances uh a really beautiful community was built that i felt like supported us and um and now in this case you know obviously supports uh a queer affirming nazarene dumb and queer people like me and so despite the fact that in some ways this feels reminiscent of other times of pain at the hands of the church it also feels like uh, yeah, another real opportunity to to grow my community and to get reconnected with a community that like has meant so much to us. Yeah. Well, I'm really glad that you um, that you all put this book together. I, I like I said, I love it. I think it's gorgeous. Um, I've enjoyed reading the stories. And I'm I'm um, there was a couple of times where I was like I got a little weepy. I was, <laughs> I was mm. like, oh my gosh, so many feelings. Um, but it's really wonderful. So as we wrap up, tell folks where they could get the book, what kind of formats does it come in? Um, are there any of the authors in the book, um, like other people that we should support um, in particular? Like, are there any ones of any prominence? Well, they're all prominent, but like, um, how can I say it? Uh, who are doing... Um, who are doing their own work in the world that we want to like kind of highlight like tom mentioned somebody in particular and i think you mentioned someone too who wrote the um the essay about parents um so give us all the details on this alexa you want to go for that sure um so the book itself can be purchased on amazon um and it, it comes in paperback hardcover and the uh, epa a uh, uh, kindle as well um but we are also as part of our, you know, sort of movement to to generate a larger conversation, posting every single essay in the book online for free um, at our website, which is lovingnazarenes.com. Um, so yeah, definitely please go ch check out those essays, read through them. They're posted um, a few every week, um, and we're really excited to sort of cont uh, continue on that conversation. Um, and as adjacently to sort of this conversation is uh, one of our contributors. James Koppel um, has led this um, project called the 1908 Project, which um, also is very specifically looking at um, LGBTQ plus affirmation in the Nazarene church. Um, Tom, any other uh, plugs or people or thoughts? <laughs> yeah, I got, I got three little plugs. One I mentioned before, a woman named Keegan uh, Osinski wrote a book called Queering Wesley. And it's a kind of a more scholarly book, but it takes John Wesley's sermons and looks at them through a queer lens. Another writer for this book is named Jonathan Foster. He oh, wrote yeah. a book. Yeah. yeah, you know Jonathan. He wrote a little book maybe five years ago, something like Why I Got Kicked Out of My Denomination. And it's his story of being asked to leave the Church of the Nazarene over this issue. So that's another book that folks might like. And then third, uh, uh, an individual named Michael Brennan is writing his doctoral dissertation with me on queer concerns and open and relational theology. That book's not yet out because he hasn't defended that, but I think that's something to be looking for in the future. Ooh, oh, exciting. and I'd like to add one pin here also. Sorry to, to jump in. Um, we're actually hosting an online conference oh, around yes. the book <laughs> um, in about a month here on May 26th and 27th. Um, it'll be two three-hour sessions online in the evening um, where we'll be discussing um, with some of the authors. I think, how many do we have total, Dad? 20 or oh, Around 40. Oh, 20 oh yeah, I guess 20 night. per night. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
it just short conversations around their essays and and um, this issue. So uh, I think Tom, do you have the link for that? Yeah, I, I was just going to put that in the Zoom chat for um, for excuse me for Jerry. Great, I'm I love it. I'm so happy for you and for y'all to do this, and I'm so grateful. Um, I also too am doing a course. Um, um, oh yeah on uh, gender, sexuality, and theology that's open to the general public. So if there are any Nazarene folks who would like to uh, get some education on this topic, <laughs> uh, you're welcome to participate. And that will, um, a link to that will be on in the description as well. It's a three week course. Um, and uh, Alexa, it would be really fun to have you there um, since that's your degree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and this is for the Episcopal Churches of Southern Maryland and the Diocese of Washington. Um, and it's a part of a longer um, effort that I'm um, leading to develop a curriculum for the Episcopal Church on um, how to be queer affirming in congregational settings. Um, and so uh, this conversation is, is being had across Christianity. It's a little tired as far as I'm concerned, but I'm glad that people are still having it, I guess. Um, and, uh, and I'm glad good people like you are leading it. So receive this blessing as a closing. Um, dear friends, remember that life is short and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who journey with us. So let us be swift to love, make haste to be kind, and the blessing of the God who is the God of peace, the nonviolent Christ, and the liberating spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you. And we will be in touch soon. Bye. Great. I put that uh, link in the 